Greetings from the UK where I'm recording this lecture. I'm going to talk to you about decision making on Labour Ward. The learning outcomes for the lecture are to understand the decision making process, to learn what information is needed to make decisions about safe delivery and to appreciate the significance of making the best decision. What are the questions to ask? Well, firstly, do I need to intervene to deliver this woman now or should I or can I wait? If I need to deliver this woman now, should this be by assisted vaginal delivery or cesarean section? If I can wait, what other support is needed? The information we need to know about the mother is, is she well? What are her vital signs in terms of blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate and temperature? Are there any relevant factors in her past medical or surgical history? And are there any relevant factors in her past or current obstetric history? We also need to know about the condition of the foetus. So what is the baseline foetal heart rate? Are there signs of foetal compromise such as late decelerations? And what is the presenting part and foetal lie? The information we need about the labour itself is firstly, is the woman in labour? Is she having regular painful contractions, progressive cervical dilation and descent of the presenting part? Are the membranes ruptured? What is the condition of the lycor? And is there any revealed bleeding? We also need to know how advanced the labour is, so we need to know the dilation of the cervix and the, descent, and the descent of the presenting part. We need to know whether she's reached the action line on the partograph. If she has, you need to think what action you will take. You need to know what the contractions are like, how many contractions she's having in 10 minutes and the duration of the contractions. You need to ask yourself if the membranes have ruptured and if not, can they be safely ruptured? The actions you can take are either to perform an artificial rupture of the membranes with or without augmentation with oxytocin or you may decide to deliver her. You should not augment for poor progress if she is already contracting four in ten minutes, if she's multigravid, had a previous caesarean section, if there is any concern over the feet or heart rate pattern, or if there's an inability to provide one-to-one -one care. When there is poor progress, the, is, the action line is reached and you are unable to augment, then you need to deliver the woman. If you've made a decision to deliver, you next have to decide whether this should be by assisted vaginal delivery or caesarean section. To do this, you can follow the flow chart shown here. First of all, is the woman fully dilated? If not, she needs delivery by caesarean section. If the cervix is fully dilated, but there's more than one fifth of the fetal head palpable abdominally, 
she also needs a cesarean section. If there's one fifth of the fetal head or less palpable abdomen and full dilatation, you need to identify the fetal position. If it's in an occipital anterior position, it's appropriate to undertake assisted vaginal delivery in the labour room. If it's in an OP, occipital posterior, or OT, occipital transverse position, then there should be a trial of assisted vaginal delivery in theatre with a spinal anaesthetic in place so that if the trial fails, the woman can be delivered immediately by caesarean section. There are sometimes difficult scenarios and decisions to be made despite a woman reaching full dilation. These are when there is suspected fetal compromise present when the descent of the presenting part is borderline, when the position is uncertain. If in doubt, you can try to fill underneath the symphysis pubis. If it's an OT position, you will feel an ear. If it's an OP position, you will feel either the nose or the eye sockets. It's also difficult when the patient is in a lot of pain and unable to push well, as she's not going to be able to help you with an assisted vaginal delivery. Another difficult scenario is a trial of vaginal delivery when there's evidence of fetal distress. The pros are that vaginal delivery is usually faster and there's less future maternal consequences you are able to perform a vaginal delivery. However, if the vaginal delivery fails and caesarean section becomes necessary, the fetal distress may worsen. So it's not a straightforward decision. How urgent is the caesarean section? It's important to remember that urgency is dependent on the situation and this can change quite rapidly. If it's an emergency, that means that the caesarean section needs to be immediate. This occurs where there's an immediate threat to the life of the woman or the fetus. The obstetrician should remain with the patient until delivery. It most often needs a general anaesthetic, as this is the quickest form of anaesthesia. And examples where this is uh, needed are things like severe unresolving bradycardia, a cord prolapse or a placental abruption. An urgent caesarean section is one where there's no immediate threat to the life of the woman or fetus, but early delivery is needed. This is usually where there's delivery required for maternal or fetal compromise. It can be performed under a regional anaesthetic. And examples of such cases are where there is severe preeclampsia, failure to progress um, with signs of fetal compromise. A non-urgent cesarean section still requires early delivery and examples of these kind of cases are things like failure of induction of labour, a planned caesarean section where a woman now has ruptured membranes, or a breach in early labour. An elective caesarean section can be performed at a time to suit the woman and the maternity services. Having decided to deliver a woman, how quickly does this need to be done? Well, an emergency means immediate delivery. So things like a cord prolapse where the baby is still alive, a placental abruption where the baby is alive, 
unresolving fetal bradycardia lasting longer than three minutes, a large unresolving bleed from placenta previa, or a strong suspicion of a scar rupture with a live baby. An urgent caesarean section should be undertaken within 30 minutes. And this is where there's fetal distress other than a prolonged bradycardia, an unresolving bleed with a dead fetus, or a suspected scar rupture with a dead fetus. A non-urgent caesarean section means within 60 minutes and examples of this is where there's failure to progress without fetal compromise despite good contractions, where you have a woman in labour with inadequately treated HIV, where you have an undiagnosed breach in labour which is unsuitable for vaginal delivery, where there is a compound presentation or where, where you have um, two or more previous cesarean section scars. You can wait when you have meconium on its own, even if it's thick, but in this instance, you need to monitor the fetal heart very carefully. You can wait when you have a primate with poor contractions and a satisfactory fetal heart rate, when you can try artificial rupture of the membranes with or without um, or oxytocin. You can wait when you have a breach making good progress and you can afford to wait when a woman is in the latent phase of labour, which can be quite long at times. If a decision is made to deliver a woman prior to the onset of labour, you need to know how best to achieve this, whether by um, induction of labour or cesarean section. Things that need to be considered are, is there a previous scar? Is the cervix favourable or unfavourable? And is there a need to deliver urgently? In terms of induction of labour, how long should you try? and should repeated doses of the induction agent be used. Other things to consider when deciding between induction of labour or a planned cesarean section are whether the gestation is certain. Remember, late scans can't date pregnancy. A scan is only accurate up to 24 weeks for dating purposes and then only to within a week. If a woman is 41 weeks and there are no problems and adequate lycor volume, you can consider waiting another week if the cervix is unfavourable as judged by the Bishop score. Methods of induction at 41 weeks um, plus include misoprostol or prostaglandin or Foley catheter induction or artificial membrane rupture with oxytocin. Also remember that a membrane sweep can sometimes help avoid induction. When should you induce labour before 41 weeks? Well, when you are concerned about pregnancy with problems such as hypertension, recurrent diminished fetal movements, recurrent bleeds, intrauterine growth retardation or multiple pregnancy, or where there have been problems in the past such as stillbirth. And you can consider if the mother is over the age of 40. So the rule is to deliver the right woman for the right reason at the right time. 
following this rule avoids birth asphyxia, avoids unnecessary cesarean section and gets it right for prima gravidi, avoiding future consequences. To look at whether we're doing the best we can, here are a couple of audit suggestions. Looking at the decision to delivery interval time. So having made the decision to deliver, how long does it actually take to deliver the baby? And then also indications for cesarean section. And are these appropriate? If you have questions about this lecture, I would encourage you to write them down and then they can be asked and discussed in the question and answering sessions. To recap, we have reviewed the information needed for decision making on labour ward, the urgency of delivery and whether this should be by cesarean section, assisted vaginal delivery or whether we can wait. And prior to labour, if we need to deliver a woman, whether we should plan for caesarean section or induction of labour. It is important to remember that things may change suddenly and you may have to review your decisions based on new information to make sure that you get the best possible outcome for the mother and baby. Thank you for listening.